Hello, I'm Mother Goose, the real Mother Goose. I am one of countless versions of the interdimensional time-traveling witch. <laughs> In my universe, we refer to dimensions as vectors. Vectors are fully formed and established coordinates, and I live in Vector 9. We are big enthusiasts of entertainment and all forms of art, and one of few witches who is curious about the worlds and artistic endeavors of other beings. I recently had a mishap in my interdimensional travels, so I was curious if Vector 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 was teeming with creative energy. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That probably isn't a thing. But life is funny. And it turns out it is your dimension. And it is rife with creative energy. When I tapped into the creative energy of Ice Blink, I was transported to a land of mystery and childlike wonder. A place where magic is real.
streets, you know, like white nationalists more emboldened than ever in our country and realizing that to be black, to be brown in this country is really, it's really scary. And I, I know that you, I mean I am for sure, thinking how am I going to keep my head up, keep demanding justice and keep dismantling white supremacy. And, and for the white folks here tonight, and I, I see quite a few of you here tonight, I'm sure you're thinking, you know, how do I show up? How do I support and, you know, be a true ally? And I think, you know, the most important and productive thing you can do right now is go back to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> go back to where you came from. <coughs> Decolonize the land. Seriously. <laughs> yeah. and, and for my people of color here tonight, you know, all I ask of you is to help them pack. <laughs> you know? <laughs> if you're feeling generous, maybe offer to give them a ride to the airport. <laughs> yeah. But this this year it's been it's been bad news after worse news, you know? And you know, I just found that self-care is becoming more and more necessary for everyday survival. And so I've been trying to take care of myself more. Um, you know that raw foods diet where you just eat raw foods? <laughs> oh, I tried that for a snack today. It's not very filling. I don't recommend it. You need protein. This past month, I actually stopped drinking coffee. This is a big feat of mine. <laughs> I love coffee, um, but it's actually been pretty good. You know, I I feel more awake. I feel way more present in the moment, um, and it's been good. I mean, the only only thing is that I just constantly want to think about, talk about, and drink coffee <laughs> all the time. You know, like coffee. It's just the flavor is so you know bold and delicious and dark and rich. It's like everything I want in a future husband, you know, in liquid form. <laughs> the great thing about coffee is that you don't have to worry about it sleeping around, you know? Yeah. Okay, well, there's one other thing that kind of sucks about not drinking coffee in the morning. It's like it wrecks havoc on your poop schedule. It really does. <laughs> Um, you should poop in the morning if you didn't know that. It's really good for your health. So if you're not doing that, you should do that. And I was doing that, I swear. I was pooping in the morning every day on the dot, you know, um, with the help of coffee. But now there are days when I get up 
I go to work and I have to poop at work. <laughs> and it's like, it's rough out there. <laughs> it's really rough. Um, the other day, I had to poop at work, and so I went to the restroom. It was all clear, nobody was in there. I was like, sweet, this is my time to shine. <laughs> so I go in there, I take a seat on the toilet, and of course somebody comes in right when I was about to get down to business. So, you know, and I, you know, I'm a, I'm an actor, I'm a professional dancer, you know, I, I'm up here telling jokes, but to be honest, it's like the moment somebody sits on the toilet in the stall next to me, we're a stage fright of my life. <laughs> <laughs> it just, everything tightens. <laughs> it's like clenches. <laughs> <laughs> nothing's coming, nothing's going, you feel me? Yeah. And so I'm just like sitting there waiting and I'm, you know, the stall next to me is of no use because stalls these days are like suggestions of walls, you know, without the sturdiness or soundproof, smellproof reliability of actual walls, you know, so I'm just sitting there and I think this is okay, I'll just wait this one out, you know, she'll <laughs> pee and then she'll peace and I'll have the bathroom to myself. Um, but no, no, instead we are sitting in a long, <laughs> extended <laughs> silence. <laughs> Talking minutes. Minutes. Long minutes of absolute <laughs> silence. Yo. I'm sure she's starting to feel the pressure too, you know? I don't know what she's doing over there. It doesn't sound like much, but maybe she's like praying or something. Like, dear baby Jesus, like, just let me pee a little bit, you know? Just like, even a little dribble would be great. Yeah. And, you know, I could go to a different bathroom and just do my business there, but I won't, because on principle, I got there first. So, you know, I'm there. I'm sitting there staging my own private sit-in in the bathroom <laughs> with the true activist that I am. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I get to thinking. Cause I don't, I'm busy. I don't have a lot of time to think. I don't have a lot of quiet time in my life. And so I, I'm here in this absolute silence. I start to think. I start, I start thinking about capitalism. <laughs> See, capitalism, like, runs so deeply in us that we feel this constant pressure to be productive. You know, we don't realize that there's more to life than just going to work, getting paid, you know? So that like applies to work. We can't just like take a poop at work without feeling guilt about things not moving along efficiently, you know? So, you know, I start to fidget. I start pulling out the toilet paper. I start like, blowing my nose and like clearing my throat because I want to sound productive. <laughs> you know, I, I want to let the woman in the next stall know that I'm working hard. You know? <laughs> I am doing my best. I am trying to move things along. <laughs> right? Um, another little epiphany I had sitting on that toilet that day was that this is not normal. I know we've been hearing that a lot. Some of you probably have buttons that say that. And it's true, it is not normal. It's not natural for people to take shits in such close proximity. I've ever had a threesome before. <laughs> I haven't. But I've gotten close. I mean, this one time I had this really hot twosome. <laughs> but I'm open to a threesome, you know? I'm open to a lot of things, actually. I was seeing this guy a while back. He told me he's interested in exploring polyamory. Be great. 
great if he could let his other lovers know that I'm the best in bed. <laughs> or while well, he's having sex with his other lovers, maybe just softly calling my name out a few times. <laughs> Something like that, I don't know. but you sounded so like convincing <laughs> on stage, you know? And I was like, I know, but did you hear how many people laughed? Like, I can't give that up for just like one night of fun. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the moment when I knew I was a true artist, you know, like living and breathing my art. <laughs> yeah. He said, you know, nobody has to know. And I was like, they know. You know, like a threesome isn't like falling up the steps. It's not something you can just like do and then walk away and pretend like nothing happened. You know, like something within you shifts when you have a threesome. Renee knows. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you just like your outlook on life is completely different. You probably see triangles everywhere. Like, triplets. I mean, I don't know, I haven't had a threesome, I just imagine. You probably smell different too, you know? But thinking, you know, talking about the number uh, three, this is actually my third, just my third time doing stand-up comedy ever. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and a lot of people have asked me why I wanted to try stand-up comedy. You know, and the answer is obviously because I hate myself. <laughs> um, yeah, so we all know that Asian babies are the cutest infants in the animal kingdom. It's a fact. Um, I, it might be hard to believe, but I once was a very adorable Asian infant as well. Um, also probably hard to believe that ever since I could talk, I've been very sassy. Um, yeah, so when I was a kid, I hated to be called cute, you know? I called it the C word. <laughs> um, I would tell, <laughs> my mom would have to like, run ahead of me before entering, before I entered the room and tell everybody not to call me cute or else I would flip a shit. Yeah, and I was like, I was sharp back then. I, uh, I had some pretty good retorts as a six-year-old. This one time I was in, in the car with my family on the way to a family reunion in Nebraska. Um, safe to say that I have a white family. Um, and so my white family and I were on our way to Nebraska for a family reunion, and I'm in the back seat with my cousins, and they're trying to put on these little heart-shaped sunglasses on me. And they do the one thing that they were warned not to do. They call me the C word. <laughs> they do, and I was like, the audacity, you know, the sheer audacity. And I look at them and I say, you know what, stop. Just go run on the freeway. <laughs> later that trip, I apparently told my other cousin to go find the tallest tree she could find, climb up it, and stay there. <laughs> yeah, I don't mess around. <laughs> um, I mentioned my white family, and you're all probably like, what? How? Well, adoption. I was adopted from China, <laughs> and uh, I was adopted by a single mother. I can't tell you how many times that people have asked me growing up, like, when did your mom let you know you were adopted? <laughs> it, it's hard, you know? Like, how do you continue to have faith in humanity after a question like that? <laughs> I don't know. 
I was talking to my mom on the phone the other day. Um, my birthday was coming up and I was debating whether or not to go home to Cleveland for my birthday or to stay here in Minneapolis. And she, you know, she says, like, it's ultimately your decision. It really comes down to whether you want to spend your birthday with me or without me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but besides from her sass, you know, she's like, she's like constantly looking out for me. Um, the other day I got a nice package in the mail from her. It had some, like, fancy spices from Penzi's, some nice home decorations, and, and a condom. <laughs> One single condom. <laughs> when your mom sends you a single condom in the mail, you gotta wonder what was going on in her head at the time. I imagine she passed by a bowl of free condoms and thought of me. <laughs> Did you know seven out of every eight women are victims of unwanted flirting on the bus? Um, yeah, I don't know if that's true, but it sounds accurate. Yeah. Um, yeah, the other the other day I was sitting on the bus minding my own business, and this guy comes up to me. I brace myself for what I was about to say, and he says, "Hey, pretty lady, you want to buy some coupons?" <laughs> I mean, if it had been any other day, I probably would have bought some coupons. <laughs> I had a long day at work. I was hangry. I did not want to buy coupons that day. <laughs> so instead, I look him in the eye and I say, go find the tallest tree you can, <laughs> climb up it, and stay there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I've been thinking a lot about how can I avoid these bus flirters. Minneapolis is teeming with bus flirters. Um, and I don't have an easy solution for any of you, unfortunately. I mean, I think probably the best solution is to avoid public transportation altogether. I mean, it can't be that hard. Why people do it all the time? <laughs> yeah. You know what also works? Adult snow pants. <laughs> it was very warm and very unsexy. <laughs> Those bus flirters, they see you in your adult snow pants and they, you know, they wonder if there's even a woman in there. <laughs> it's like the Minnesota Norse chastity belt. <laughs> and I can confidently walk around knowing that nobody's getting a piece of this insulated ass, you know? <laughs> it's dope. <laughs> I mean, I honestly would actually get a car, but unlike other brilliant, beautiful Asian women, fully accept that I'm a shit driver. Yeah, that's funny. Well, fuck stereotypes.
seriously, like, I like look at them and I'm like, seriously, if anybody in this relationship ought to be Buddhist, not. You know, and the, and the worst part of it is, is that they don't know how to properly eat a lady out. <laughs> They suck at it. Well, not literally. <laughs> you know, most of the time I just lie there and I'm like, She was she was deeply concerned that maybe I just hadn't found the right white boy. Yeah. Apparently the best sex she ever had was with a white motorcyclist in a tent. You know, she's right. Like I, I haven't tried that. Yeah, but you know, it's scientifically proven that white privilege gets so deeply lodged into the ear canals of white people that they're physically incapable of hearing what's coming out of their mouth. It's a problem. You know? Um, so in my last, and, and note this final relationship with a white boy, I nearly had a heart attack when I found out that he was peeing in his sink. <laughs> <laughs> Why? It's a good question. Thanks for asking. I, I asked him that too. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and he tells me, and I quote, so he wouldn't have to waste water by flushing the toilet. I just think that's a really gross poetic metaphor for white environmental activism. <laughs> And our relationship has down the drain. <laughs> this is where patriarchy comes in, you know, because he gets to traipse around peeing and sinks willy nilly. <laughs> Yet somehow he's the one to break up with me. <laughs> and I was like, really? You really want to say goodbye to all of this? all of this Asian goodness, you know? But to be honest, I'm, I'm relieved because you know what they say, it takes two to tango, but only takes one to masturbate. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Julia. I feel that sad, you know, especially that part about the bathroom. I didn't know this emotion until I came to this dimension. Embarrassment? See, in my dimension, we just swap now on this pole, and it literally...
journey of emotion. Give it up for Jacques Pau!
was? No, seriously, where am I? Who am I? This isn't my skin. Well, I, I do remember who's up next. In her recent interdimensional travels, Mother Goose came across a troupe of performers, Bella Yaga. They sang songs so sweetly of dying, they made her weep like an infant gosling. I've invited them here tonight into my garden to create for us a journey. I don't know yet what lies beyond that gate. They haven't told me much. I do know that we are all invited on a sort of crossing over and back again. Of course, they have told me that participation in this journey is entirely voluntary. You may leave at any moment, but if you do choose to join us beyond these gates, we ask that you shed your belongings and only bring yourselves. Leave your drinks, leave your bags, Mother Goose will ensure their safety. And now without any further ado, it's Mother Goose's great honor to present to the Seward Cafe Green Space, Bella Yaga, performing a metamorphosis of sorts.
within an hour. that you think it will keep you warm. Instead, you burn from the inside out. The tower. The fire licks outward through cracks in your skin. Stinging, ears ringing. It wakes you from deep slumber. Caterpillar. You now see your whereabouts, the stench of everything slowly dying around you. How you've lost your way. 